There you go. Let me see how I get out of that. I know I just need to. You're committing to be recorded. So which button do I hit? The left one or the right one? That one. Hi, Marshall. I'm Jill. Hi, Jill. Good to see you again. Been a while. Yep. I guess you can see my name. I can't see my name. <laughs> Roshi, I don't know if you remember, but this um, At Hell's Gate was one of the first books you and I read together. Yeah, that was a long time ago. Back in the day. Back when I could read real books. <laughs> And I didn't need a Kindle. Well, everything changes, doesn't it? It surely does. Now I need a walker to walk around with. Me. Yeah. Greg, Let's how are you doing? There. Is that my buddy Greg? That's my buddy Greg. Hi, Greg. Good evening, everyone. I see you, Roshi. Hello. Hey. Long time to see you, Greg. Long time. It's been like 24 hours and stuff. Weird, man. Yeah, just about. Hey, Greg, when are you, when are you coming down again? I am uh, going to be there on the 12th through the 17th, so we could definitely hook up. All right. I was thinking uh, I would have my um, that refuge document finished. I'll send it to you the week before. All right. We'll talk about on. that. You need, you need to schedule time to talk to me soon. Yeah, agreed. Okay. Yeah, I've been rereading it, rewriting it, and uh, want to make a few changes to it. Okay. But I'd like to do face to face uh, sometime over that week if we can. Okay. Yeah, we can do that. Uh, there we go. There's uh, Shinrai. How you doing? All right. Good to see you. Good to see you too, Rushi. It looks like you got a. Uh, it looks like you got a, uh, a punching bag hanging over your head. Jana, how are you? I think that's Jana. Is that Jana? That's the uh, yeah, punching yeah. bag of Damocles, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, further back. <laughs> it's just. It's a very interesting optic. <laughs> As they say. Hi, Jana. Nice to see you again. Did you color your hair? No, my I I haven't met up uh, matched up schedules with the lady that cuts it yet. So ah. we're just kind of making do. Okay. Uh. Well, thank you everyone for joining us this evening. Um, promises to be an interesting time. I'm not sure exactly how um, Anson's gonna, gonna handle this tonight. I don't know how much time he wants to give us, but um, he is looking forward to talking with us a little bit. We talked to him this afternoon uh, to make sure we were on, on schedule and everything. That was good, so. I, uh, he, he said he was wondering, he couldn't remember what town I was in, whether Las Cruces was north of Albuquerque or south of Albuquerque. And I said, it's south of Albuquerque, brother. And you and I, you and I met in uh, El Paso at the Zen Center there. And I, and I corrected myself. It wasn't a Zen Center. It was a Unitarian Church. And it just happens I have this, this here. This is he and I at that meeting. <laughs> mm. Anyway, hello. Who do we have here? Jen, Jenna. Hi, Jenna. Hello, Daiho. I am one of Shuke's students. Ah, where, where do you hail from? I'm in San Diego. San Diego, my goodness. That's a beautiful city. It is, I love it here. I, I, I visited the Japanese gardens there one time. It's amazing. Have you been there? 
I have. It's an absolutely beautiful place. Yeah, it is. It's 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 it is beautiful. That's for sure. Hi, Tomio. Hello, Kyoji. Good to see you. You too. We'll make quick introductions as soon as it gets to be seven o'clock, and and uh, and Anson uh, comes on. So. But I want to thank you all for, I'm going to keep saying that because everybody's new and pops in. Thank you all for coming tonight. Shinrai and I just got back from a, uh, a weekend primitive camping out in the middle of the um, Hula National Park. And we were without cell service or, or Wi-Fi. It was quite interesting. <laughs> Useful. Yeah, well, it was a little anxiety provoking because I wanted to be able. Well, there's Claude. Hi, Anson. How are you? Good to see you. And who do we have there? Um, this is my Anshin. She's uh, this is Jen from Australia. Uh, Australia. Hello. Hello. Nice to meet you. You too. And who's that? Connecting to audio. Just calling. Uh, That's Claude. That okay. And then I An think Angie. 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 Hi, Angie. Well, uh, Anshin, we have, um, apparently we're combining a couple of our sanghas. My, my, uh, my wife's uh, students and, and my students um, are, have come together here for this this uh, auspicious occasion. Um, all right, we got still about five minutes to go. Uh, and I, well, there's Joel. Hello, Joel. You're my, you're muted. Joel and Joel and um, Shinrai and I did the Bataan Death March together. Uh, they were my support team, so to speak. <laughs> they had to carry me through the whole 14 miles. <laughs> anyway. Not true. He walked the whole distance, all of it. Yes, I did, but uh, not without your help. Thank you very much. Hi, Joel. Good evening, Jill. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm well, thank you. I'm looking forward to our talk this evening. Thank you for the invite. Yes. Uh, uh, Anson, um, Jill up there in the corner, she uh, reminded me, she was my student before she became my wife's student uh, years and years ago. And uh, where'd you go? Did you disappear? Oh, there, there you are. Yeah. Um, and if, she reminded me that one of the very first books that we studied together was this one it made a big impact on me? How about that? Well, hello. Oh, there is Denise. Hi, how are you doing? Hi, hello. How are you? I'm good. I'm so happy to be here. My husband is coming. Yeah. Oh, he's actually he's here. He's just across the way, not on the camera. Okay. Well, we're reminded that we should probably. Um, Almost everybody, but uh, Claude Anshin and I will uh, uh, mute our mute our mics uh, okay. so we don't get kind of great. There's my wife. Hello, Shuke. How are you? Um, Anshin, you never met my my wife. This is um, uh, Shuke, my my darling, loving wife. Uh, Hello. There's, there's, Hello Anshin. You. there's Derek. Okay, it looks like we got a full boat here. I think we can accommodate, I don't know how many, probably as many as we have, we can accommodate. Uh, we got, yeah, it's 558, might as well start a little bit. I guess people can pop in whenever they want. Um, for those of you who have never met me, and there's some here that haven't, I am uh, Daiho uh, and Daiho Hilbert on the, uh, founding abbot of the Order of Kermine Zen. And um, 
uh, I don't know what else I need to say about that. Uh, I met uh, our guest uh, several years ago uh, when he was walking from, I think it was from Florida to San Diego, if I'm not mistaken, uh, doing some doing some border uh, border awareness stuff um, and and then uh, I attended a, a, a two I think two or three retreats of his that he put on uh, he does retreats for veterans um, and very powerful powerful speaker and powerful man uh, a marvelous uh, Zen Buddhist teacher he wrote this book um, that we're going to study in our study group called At Hell's Gate, a, uh, a soldier's journey from war to peace. And I gotta say, it's, I highly recommend it. We're gonna be using it in our, in our class uh, on Wednesday evenings. And recently he came out with this book, uh, Bringing Meditation to Life. It's a 108 Zen uh, teachings on the path of Zen practice. And I lent this to one of my students and I haven't been able to read it yet. So I, 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 I'm assuming it's really good. Um, so anyway, on that, I, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Anshin. Uh, Anshin, take as much time as you'd like. Um, and I'm not sure how you want to proceed. I, we talked a little bit this afternoon about it. Uh, so you go, okay? Greetings. Welcome to the Magnolia Zen Center here in Mary Esther, Florida. Mary Esther, Florida is located in the Panhandle in the northwest part of Florida. I don't know if any of you, if I don't know where you're calling in from, but uh, if you know anything about the Florida, it's this very long peninsula. And then on the top, there's a piece that borders um, Georgia, Alabama, Georgia and Alabama. Um, and we're up in that part. And I've been here since 1999. Now, um, where I and I first met, we met in El Paso, Texas. Um, it was part of a border pilgrimage. Actually, we started, I, I would like to say we started in Florida, that's not true. And we started in Brownsville, Texas, and we walked to Borderfield State Park. Um, that was one of many uh, pilgrimages that I've, that I've walked uh, together with my assistant, who's German, um, she's been with me for 25 years. Um, the first pilgrimage that I walked was from Yonkers, New York to San Francisco. Um, and then I've walked several thousand miles. Oh, actually that's not tr true. The first pilgrimage I walked was where I was ordained. I was ordained, ordained in Poland, in Auschwitz at the site of one of the crematoriums. And then I walked from Poland to Vietnam. Um, I'm a combat soldier in Vietnam. I served in the army. I was there in 1966 and 1967. Um, I went, went over as an infantryman um, uh, without a, an assignment. Uh, I was in a replacement battalion. They assigned me as a door gunner um, in an assault helicopter company. And um, I served a tour in the 116th assault helicopter company. I spent a significant amount of time in the hospital as a result of wounds received from Vietnam. Um, um, my life when I came back, it's described in the book, but my life when I came back, um, you know, I, I didn't have any connection between my military training, my combat experience, and how my life was unfolding. I, there was just, it was a, I was a disconnected. Um, I can tell you that on the 2nd through the 4th of May, 1970, I was in Kent State uh, when the protests were happening in Kent State and when the students were killed there. Um, what I, I, I've written about that experience, um, I had some inkling that there was a connection between my combat experience and my inability to make sense out of the world that I now existed in. Um, regular life didn't make any sense to me. 
Um, I just didn't seem to fit anywhere. Um, what I've come, what I, I've recently come to the understanding, and I'm saying only recently come to the understanding that through my combat experience, I, I, I had a, I was presented with an awareness about reality that was too big for me to process. And I didn't have a spiritual practice. I, I wasn't aware that the truth of life was really spiritual. There is no spiritual path. There is no spiritual way. Life is spiritual. It's what I often echo to, to the people who, who I have the privilege to support, um, who are interested in this way, is that uh, meditation and daily life are not two things. We too often separate them. We too often uh, are looking for a spiritual path, which means we're looking for something that we identify as spiritual and attempting to get our life to conform to that. And um, that's, it's, it's shallow, delusional, and fraudulent. It's how to live. It's, it's, for me, the, the point was how to wake up. And I didn't even know that that was the point. Um, I was just attempting to escape this awareness that I was living with. The, the, re, the awareness that I was living with, the reality that I was living with, was that violence under any circumstances is not a solution. It only gets more violence. So it was the I was I was imbued with the with the intrinsic law of karma. For every action, there's a consequence. We just cannot know how it will manifest itself or to what degree. Um, I so for the longest for a period of time in my life, my all of my efforts were made at escaping or getting rid of the awareness that I had. I identified this awareness through the feelings that would surface, to the thoughts that I would have. And I was, I was um, living in Northwest Pennsylvania in a place called Slippery Rock. I was going to college there. And um, I, I, had a, I lived in a small house. I lived together um, with a, a woman I had met at school. We, weren't, we were not married at the time. And, and we had a small child. Um, I, at, at night, I would uh, I had a shotgun beside my bed. I had a knife under the pillow, and uh, I had a I had a handgun on the dresser, always loaded, always off safe, always ready to fight. And and it would happen that at night, um, outside of the window in the bedroom that we had, um, there was a, a street light, and the street light had this yellowish white kind of light to it, and that yellowish white light brought me, um, it stimulated memories of parachute flares. So at night, and we had, a, we did a lot of, we did a lot of, um, we had a lot of missions at night. Now, fighting at night when I was in Vietnam was much different than fighting at night now. We had no night vision. Um, we had no way to, we, we were just, we were just blind. But they would always, the, the, they would drop these flares. Um, they would just light up, light up the, the area like a foot, like the lights, the floodlights do in a, in a sports stadium. And, but the light was this yellowish kind of light. And, and so that street light would sometimes trigger and I could see outside the window, I could see um, Vietnamese running by the window. Now, at some level, I, I knew that this probably wasn't true, but it was so very real for me. And, and I didn't know how to work with that in any skillful way. I, I didn't have the tools to know how to live at peace with my unpeacefulness. Because the truth is, how I was affected, the consequences of my, of, of my life, service being a part of that, never go away. I, my responsibility is to know how to live at peace, to, to, to discover how to live at peace with that unpeacefulness. Um, I haven't slept more than two hours consecutively in any night since 67. 
um, that used to be problematic for me. Um, it, it, was a sh it was shortly after, um, it was shortly after I was ordained in, in, and had finished that first pilgrimage um, when I, I was uh, living in Concord, Massachusetts in a small hermitage there and I was washing dishes and looking out the window and I had the voice of awareness. It, it just said to me, so you can't sleep, now what? And really I just, I laughed. I just chuckled because it was such, it was just this moment of surrender. I just surrendered. I gave up, in that moment, I gave up all my ideas of how I've ever been conditioned to, to view the topic of sleeping and just accepted that this is the way I sleep. This is the way this works. Now, how, how do I manage my life given this reality? And for me, that's what Zen practice is about. It's about waking up. So this is how I am. Now, how do I manage that in, in relation with the world around me? Um, since uh, I, I um, the most important part of this process to, to um, begin to become, to begin to develop a more conscious relationship with how I was affected um, could only begin when I stopped taking intoxicants. I, I went into a, a drug and alcohol rehabilitation center in 1983 in New Hampshire. And um, I haven't taken any mood altering or mind altering substances to include alcohol since. And, and once, I, once I took away those buffers and, and began to find some supports, um, I, I was able to begin to clear up some of the wreckage of my past and, and at the same time, get closer and closer to how I was get closer and closer to the effects that the war had on that, that um, the consequences of my combat, my military service of combat experience. Um, I, I, I never, I don't call myself a pacifist. Um, uh, but I'm on, I'm unarmed. <laughs> I, mean, I, I gave up, I gave up guns a long time ago, man. Guns are not a good idea for me. Um, uh, I, and, uh, and I, I have this unwavering commitment. And as a, result of, as a result of the way Zen practice has unfolded for me, um, I have the privilege of being invited into some really not nice places. And I've, I've been into the Balkans a couple, two, three times during the, while the fighting was still going on. And I have an opportunity to talk with soldiers who are on the line, soldiers who are in hospital, um, uh, people who who have been displaced because of fighting. Um, and not that I have anything in particular to say to them, other than to let them know that um, the illusion that we hold onto that when all of that is finished, you know, if I just do the right thing, then my life will fall into place. And when all of this is finished, then I can get back to life, like it, I can get back to my regular life. It's like COVID, you know, when COVID's done and everything will be back to normal. Well, the truth is that COVID will never be done. We live with it now forever. It's going to be with us until it'll be, it's just going to be with us. We have to learn to live in relation with that. Um, and, and that's beginning to happen for us. Um, but this, this notion that everything will be back the way it was, um, it, that flies in the face of the teaching of impermanence, of the, te the, the reality that everything that comes into existence passes away. And that happened consistently, constantly. It happens with each breath. One moment is different from the next. They're never the same. This idea of, con the notion of continuity is a, is a self-created idea. So um, what, I, what I chronicled through the, through the book at Hell's Gate was this process of, of, um, of awakening. Um, awakening, um, to, the, to, to a way to, to embrace life that supported me and gave me the tools to learn to live at peace with this own peacefulness. I was presented a map and, and it was handed to me. And then the people said, okay, now you have to navigate. And, and so I, I, I have also the privilege to, to go into war zones, to offer these tools to people. I, have, um, I offer meditation retreats routinely, um, regularly to veterans. 
um, all through the period of, of, of COVID, um, I've been meeting every week. I have a, a, there's a veterans gathering that has been meeting every week on Sundays. Um, and we've had like 375 consecutive meetings now or something like that. Um, and, and so it has presented me, me um, oh, oh, this, this COVID experience has presented us with some unique opportunities to, to connect when we otherwise wouldn't. Um, I, I live a very, um, I live a very uh, disciplined life. Uh, first thing I do when I get up in the morning is I make my bed. Like I never slept in it. And then the next thing I do is I sit. And I make a commitment in that I, I, I sit and then I do some simple recitations. And then I, and, and at the conclusion of that recit of the recitations, um, I make a commitment to not hurt myself or someone else, to be of service. I, I, I recite the Bodhisattva vows, the four great vows every morning. Um, and then I, I just enter into my day. I, I, I don't know what it means to be, a, I don't know what it means to be a monk. And I don't pretend to know. What I, what I do know is that I just, um, I, I stay with the basics that were given to me and, and, and see how my life unfolds when I just stay committed to those simple things. Letting go of all of my ideas of things. Um, and trust me, I have a multitude of ideas of things. I have, a, I have an active mind. Um, at night, before I, I go to bed, um, I do the same thing. I turn my bed down. Um, I light a candle and some incense. I sit and I do some recitations. The, the, um, the recit a recitation that I do every night, it's an evening gatha. I'm, you know, I haven't yet found out where it comes from. I know that it was passed on to me through um, the abbot at the Salt Lake Zen Center in, that's in the tradition I'm ordained. And the, the evening gatha goes, let me respectfully remind you, life and death are of supreme importance. Time passes swiftly by and opportunity is lost. Each of us must strive to awaken. Awaken, take heed, do not squander this life. Um, I, I, I make every effort to live my life um, by, um, guided by these vows and commitments. Um, I really do think, though, I've, I've talked quite enough. Um, what I would like to do um, is uh, stop talking and open it up for your questions. Um, I will say, though, that um, every Thursday, um, we do, uh, we have a period of formal sitting followed by recitations here at the Magnolia Zen Center, and we do that online. And every Saturday morning, now here, here in the Panhandle where I'm located or where the center is located, we're in central standard or central time. Um, people associate Florida with Eastern time. Florida has two time zones. We happen to be in central time. Um, what, I, what I can do is I can put a website um, in the chat box. Um, D -A -L -D -O um, this is a website for the foundation that, that um, I've had the privilege to, to begin back in 93 and that has grown. Um, um, if, if you're interested in, the, in joining us for a sitting, um, I will just say that you need, need to be there um, online five minutes before the appointed uh, time. Um, we do have a Jiki Jitsu who monitors that and and uh, she will, if you're new, she'll remind you that if you come again to please, and you're late, she'll remind you if you please, if you come again, please be on time. Um, or what we do is we ask people to um, wait in a waiting room. And then when we begin to do recitations, to come in and join us. It's not different than when a, in the formal retreats that we facilitate. We, I ask people to be on, um, be in the Zendo on their cushion five minutes before the appointed sitting time. Um, if they're not there five minutes before, the door is closed and locked. And we ask them to please wait until we then do kinhin or walking meditation, and then they can come and join us. Um, discipline is key to this process. 
um, is not something to be taken lightly. What I understood is that, that we cannot do whatever we want and call that practice. I mean, we can, but that doesn't make it so. And we have to be, and uh, I think uh, it's important to be very cautious about this. Also on Sundays um, at 11 a.m. Central Daylight Time, it is an open session of questions and responses. It's joined by an international group. And at 6 p.m. Central Daylight Time on Sundays, a veterans gathering. Um, all those are listed at, on the foundation's website. Um, any of you are, are welcome to join. So again, what I'll do is I'll, I'll stop talking and I'll open up for questions. You can ask me anything you want. Nothing is out of bounds, but please ask a question. Don't make a statement. If you disagree with anything I've said or have a different opinion, um, I really don't wanna argue or discuss about that now. I'm glad to meet with you privately if you want, um, but I'll tell you in advance, whatever your position is, you're already right. There's no sense to argue or debate. Um, so, questions? You can just raise your hand and I'll, I'll call you by the name that's on your screen. Okay, Greg. Hey, where are you calling in from, Greg? Oh, you're muted, buddy. Thank you. Sorry about that. Yeah, I'm from Baltimore, Maryland. Baltimore, uh, Maryland. Oh, yeah. yeah one of Roshi's uh, Daiho students. So I read the book and I appreciate the language about your choice of the word bells as a, as a reminder for practice in various conditions. I was wondering if you could touch on uh, how your relationship to anger has changed. As I, if you'll pardon me, a little, going a little further, I know as you talked about your pilgrimages, mm -hmm. there seemed to be many opportunities where anger could manifest. <laughs> it seemed like uh, you had come a long way uh, with respect to anger during the well, pilgrimage versus your former life. I was wondering if you could touch on that, please. Well, what I can what I can say is that um, uh, when I left um, alcohol and drug treatment uh, for the first year of not using alcohol and other drugs, um, I carried an unlicensed handgun everywhere. I was never unarmed because I simply didn't feel safe. Um, somewhere between 10 months and a year of not using in intoxicants, I went, I, I drove out on, on Route 1 on the Tobin Bridge. It's a bridge that goes over the Charles River. It's quite high. People use it as a suicide jump. I, I pulled over, stopped my car, threw my handgun in, in the Charles River and almost had a heart attack when I let it go. First step, that was the first step in, in, in being willing to live in a different relationship with how I was conditioned to deal with conflicts in the world. If in an interaction with you, I felt um, I, I, I experienced feelings that were un, not comfortable to me, um, I would see you as the problem. And so, um, I would, my conditioning was if I, if I just overwhelm you or get rid of you, then I, I will be okay. I'll feel all right. So I started from um, 1983. I was ordained in um, 93. Um, so I had already begun a process of, of being, of learning that I could tolerate this plethora of feelings that I was having that I had no idea what they were. And then I, I was also being given tools where when those feelings would come into existence, I could watch them give rise to give rise to thoughts. Those thoughts and feelings when they married formed perceptions of, of what I needed to do to not feel like I felt. And I learned that um, they weren't really to be trusted all that much. They weren't giving me good information. And so, um, I began to develop certain kind, certain skills before I came to Zen practice that um, helped me to not react um, so strongly. Once I came into Zen practice, um, the first three, the first monastery I lived and studied in um, was in France. It was in a Vietnamese community, so I was living in in the heart of my enemy, and there I was confronted with images of the war all the, all of the time, and and. It was there that I began to understand that, that um, I'm not a good or bad person because of what I did. I am responsible. So if I'm, res I'm responsible now 
So I need to live my life differently now. So as these feelings came up, as, as the feelings came up and my go-to was anger, rage, um, destruction, chaos, uh, I, I understood that, that I, I didn't, I just didn't have to do that. Now, does that mean that I'm, I don't get angry? Um, yes, I, I do get angry. Uh -huh. um, but um, I've, I've learned, I've, I, it really, it's just, it's, an, it's been an evolutionary process. So when those feelings rise, bam, it's just like a meditation bell. Like when we sit, if, um, I don't know how, I don't know how um, and Daiho does this, but when we sit, um, to begin the period of silent sitting, um, we wake up the bell and then help it to sing three times. Um, so th that's an invitation to really just come back to the breath, to really stay rooted in the breath. Because if, if I'm not consciously aware of my breathing, if I'm not rooted in my breath, then I'm not present in this moment. That means that I'm being controlled by the conditioning that's been passed on to me and that I've inherited from family generations, from, from uh, culture, society, um, various institutions, the collective conscious. And, and they're, they're telling me how I'm supposed to act. And the truth is I don't have to act that way. I have to learn how to respond in given moments. And I can only do that if I'm in the present moment because in the present moment, the circumstances that I'm involved in inform me. They tell me, they show me how to respond. And, and so um, I, when I stopped reacting in, in conditioned ways, um, there was this, I found myself in, um, well, they define it in Buddhist literature as, the, as bardo hells. It's a, the bardo hell is a space between, it's a transitional space between um, realms that we exist in. And so I found myself in this bardo hell where I didn't know where I was at. I didn't have any reference points. I didn't know what to do. And I, I, I had to, it, it, it took time to just understand that even though I didn't, that if I was just patient, if I didn't react in ways I had been conditioned to react and just gave myself some time that the world around me would nurture me, help me, um, to develop ways of responding rather than reacting. And uh, I, I have to say that uh, um, I wish I could say that, that no, I, I, I do pretty okay with it today. I, I do, you know, I sometimes can get caught, I can get reactionary, um, but if they're short bursts and, and, I'm, I, and I'm quite okay with it. I'm glad that I have them. I mean, it lets me know I'm alive. Questions? Yes, um, looks like Jenna. Ooh, there we go. There you go. <laughs> Head problems unmuting. Um, you, do you still only sleep two hours a night? Is it just two hours or do you get up and walk around for a little bit and then sleep for another two hours? Yeah, what I'll say is that um, sometimes it's, 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 a, it's an interesting sleep pattern. It's technically, technically defined as a disturbed sleep pattern. So um, I might sleep 30 minutes, wake up, and uh, I might just settle for a while and then I might drift off again. So uh, it's not two hours, wake up, and then do something in two hours. Um, often I'm able to just, often today I'm able to just, um, when I wake up, I'm able to just relax, um, uh, maybe reposition my body. Um, just only three days ago, um, I, had an, I had the most un, unusual experience. Since, since I've been here on the panhandle, where, where, I, where the center is located, we're in the midst of seven military um, bases here. Um, Air Force Special Operations is just down the road. Eglin Air Force Base, they have a lot of ranges here. So th there's a lot of activity here from time to time. Um, now, since the, now since the pullout in Iraq and Afghanistan, there's a, a lot of 
men and women who have been, um, some of them for 20 years, who've never had really any downtime. They've come back, had a short break. They're, they're just going from mission to mission to mission. They've been being deployed into, um, for over 20 years. Now suddenly they don't have a mission. So what has happened is there's been a spike in suicides. There's been a spike in DWIs. There's been a spike in, in uh, domestic violence. There's been a spike in um, interactions and say DUIs or inter negative interactions with law enforcement. And, and I've been, um, the word got out that, the word got out that I'm in the area and that, that I, I'm, I'm not hesitant to engage with people in these spaces. And so I get called in. Um, I've done, I, I'm averaging like two or three suicide interventions a month. Uh, on top of that, several um, alcohol and drug related interventions, um, not only with the veteran themselves, but with um, uh, family members. Um, now, I had a particularly challenging in, um, experience where um, I came into a, uh, I came into a veterans, I was invited into a veterans house with a suicide event for, that was um, talking suicide. And when I came into his house, um, he was sitting in the easy chair with a handgun in his lap, um, hammer cocked, safety off. And uh, that, that ended, let's say I was able to have a successful uh, conversation with him. I was able to have him um, ease the hammer off, um, um, take the magazine out, unchamber the round, and uh, hand me the handgun. Um, and and we got him into the, the we got him into some care care that I hope is supportive for him. That night, however, I was lying in my bed, and uh, there was a a crack, really loud crack, outside. It sounded like lightning hit right outside my window. And my body recoiled, and it, I, it, I was shot. It felt like I was shot. And 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 uh, when I when I realized that that it was it was I it was a dream. I was going to say it was just a dream, but it was a dream. Um, I at that point I I got up, um, I walked to the bathroom, um, had a glass of water, um, got to wipe my face down, and went back into my bedroom. Uh, sat on the edge of the bed, and then I went and sat on the cushion until I could slow, uh, I could steady out a bit. Then I lay back down and I, and I fell asleep again, man, 30 minutes, 40 minutes. Um, but it's, it's just like that. It, it's um, fall asleep for a while. Somebody, some people say it's a combat sleep pattern. I, I just, it's just how I sleep. You know, you get it while you can. And uh, it's amazing how rested I can be on a on a 20 minute fall asleep thing. Yeah, I was wondering about that because I know other veterans who have had the same kind of interrupted sleep pattern. So I was wondering if that was still prevalent with you. So yeah, thank you. Yeah. yeah, you're welcome. No, I, it, it was at that point of acceptance that suddenly it became just okay. Huh? Questions? Wow. Did he? Yes. Home, Catherine. <laughs> I, I should change that, I guess. Um, I'm interested to know, you said something to the effect of um, <laughs> discipline is key in practice. We cannot do whatever we want and call it practice. That's pretty good. Yeah, that's what I said. I'm, I'm interested to know in, in how you get that across to students, because I find that students are often willing to accept that in the beginning of their training. Mm -hmm. And as they get further along, tend to think, well, I've got it now. Now I'm going to tweak this and do it my way. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm wondering how you kind of finesse your training in that regard? Well, well, first I'll say, I don't really train people. And what I do is I pass on to them the skill, the tools that have been passed on to me. Now, when I, when, um, if they're studying, if they want to study in, in the lineage in which I'm ordained, 
Um, that means that they want to learn really intimately the craft of being uh, um, a monastic, because I, I really live in a monastic way. Um, I've studied the Vinaya. Um, I follow those. Te- I follow those teachings as I was instructed by um, a Sri Lankan monk, uh, Dhamma Vihari. I studied with him for a year when I did the study in the Vinaya. Um, so um, I pass these on. I don't expect people to do it the way exactly the way I do it, but I do expect them to do it exactly. And so, um, what I've had to what I've had to learn through this process is I've had to to watch people, uh, and and really it's like practices for those who want it, not those who who need it. And so those who are gonna stay, they're gonna stay. Those who want to like get relaxed and sort of sort of do their own thing, they're not gonna stick around here. They're not gonna they're not gonna stay connected with me. They're gonna go off on their own. They're gonna do what they do. And, and I don't have any objections to that. Um, if they have received, however, um, this, for example, if they've seen Jukai from me or if they've, if they've received um, the 10 precepts from me, um, where they get the Wageza, um, if, if they're gonna go off on their own to do what they wanna do, then they can't associate themselves with me or this lineage. Um, so, right. so I just, I, I don't fuss with them, you know? Um, I just hold steady because um, I was told by the first person, by the first monk that I studied with, um, one the most important message he gave me was that um, to, to really live this life, um, I, I have to be re- ready to give up everything. I have to be, I have to be not attached. Um, I, I don't even, it, that's a funky word, but a funky phrase, but I have to be, um, I have to be willing to just say no. I have to be willing to just stay steady. And so um, that's what I do, you know? It's a practice in and of itself, isn't it? To stay steady? Yes. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I do this, I do this, I do this for, for me. I don't do this for other people. Mm-hmm. If other people benefit from that, and they will, if they, if they also engage in it, they will benefit. But if they engage in it looking for something, Mm-hmm. then they're going to be disappointed. So right. I, I constantly stress it to sit just to sit, walk just to walk, eat just to eat. Right. And, and that, that really needs to be enough. If it's not enough, then, then people will become dissatisfied and they will go off seeking, they'll go off to dusty, ro- dusty realms seeking all sorts of stuff. Exactly. And so I, 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 they can do that. It's all right with me. Thank you, Anshin. You're very welcome. Questions? I'm going pardon, par- pardon my interruption. Um, let's take a 30 seconds of silence. Uh, maybe you can, during that time, reflect on what uh, Reverend Anshin has been talking about and relate something to your own experience that you might bring up and and ask him uh, to comment on or something like that. So let's take 30 seconds or so uh, and just be in silence. I'll uh, invite the bell to ring at the conclusion of the 30 seconds. So who has a comment or question? 
Yeah, go ahead. Um, Daishin. First, thank you so much for your for your time and your words. It's where are you calling in from, Daishin? Uh, I live in Atlanta. Oh, so not too live, much up the road from you. You live up country. <laughs> yeah, just a little bit. Yeah. So I'm curious. Um, this this uh, radical acceptance of your of your sleep pattern. Uh, how is that kind of acceptance? How is that manifested in other parts of your life? Where has that been useful in in other areas? Um, first, I will say my acceptance is not radical. Okay. It's just acceptance. Uh, and, and I think that that applies in all areas of my life. Um, and the, an example is that, so here in the panhandle, I, I don't, so I, you live in Atlanta, so it's pretty urban. Um, here in the panhandle, I live in the heart of um, um, sort of, political right-wing Christianity. Um, I see people driving around their cars with white, white supremacy symbols. Um, you routinely see um, parades of vehicles going down the road, flying the um, Confederate stars and bars. And, and, and I have a person who, who helps with the, uh, I have a, there is a mechanic who, who supports us with, with the work on the vehicles that the foundation has. And and they they listen to radio stations that make uh, that make um, the Proud Boys and the Three Percenters seem middle of the road. <laughs> so, and and yet I I have an okay relation with all of these folks because it in they 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 really I am I am um, I'm transparent in who I am. I'm not there to convince or sell anything to anyone. Um, I always am looking for where am I connected, not where I am different. To, so how the how acceptance plays in this is that um, accepting the interconnected reality that is this existence. So um, I am, where am I connected to them? How? Not where am I different? It's too easy to find differences. Um, I don't. I have no interest in, in arguing with people. It's in the Dhammapada. If you haven't read it, please do. Um, and I would recommend the. I would recommend the version from Eknath Esvaran. Um, it's a. It's a wonderful book. His commentaries are quite interesting, and and in the Dhammapada, it's it's clearly stated that um, that it's 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 rather a waste of time to enter into to enter into argument and dis and and, and um, uh, so argumentative conversation to pr prove my rightness to your wrongness. And I, I just don't have time for it anymore. And, and uh, it, it's like now, still, when I go into the supermarket or if I go into a, a, a space that's tight, um, I still wear a mask. I'm vaccinated and I didn't hesitate. People ask me, People ask me, say, oh, are you going to get vaccinated? I, that's a silly question to ask a veteran. You know, I, I can't tell you how many vaccinations I had when I was in the military, and I never had a choice. They just lined you up and, 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 <laughs> and jacked you up, you know? And, 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 and I injected all kinds of drugs into my body. And so, yes, however, my getting vaccinated, my wearing mask is not so much, it's not a selfish act, but I see it as a, uh, a bodhisattva act. I do this. I do this to to support the world around me. Uh, but but I I I don't have I I'd like to say I don't have any. Um, I'd like to say I don't have any reactions to people who don't do that, um, because that that's of course that wouldn't be true. Um, I know I, in Home Depot during the height of the pandemic when masks were were mandated, and you'd walk in there and. And I'd be walking in the aisle, and and I'd see somebody who had certainly had comorbidities, and and uh, walking around without a mask and stuff. And and really, I wanted to get a two by four and just hit them. Um, I didn't do that, um, but that I have that kind of reaction. But again, it's like I say, okay, so how was I like that? Well, I can remember. Um, I've always been a motorcycle rider. 
And I can remember um, when I was writing, like in my 20s, when I was fresh out of the military, they just passed the helmet law in Pennsylvania. And I said, I ain't wearing no helmet. You know, so I can identify with that kind of person. I ain't wearing no seatbelt. You know, um, smoking's not good for you. It leads to all sorts of diseases. Oh, I don't care. I'm just like, I'm going to smoke anyway. And I, I, I identify with that kind of, so where, where am I connected? I, um, so acceptance falls into that. I, I'm, where am I connected to them? Not where am I separate? Um, and all sorts of things. Questions? Based on Daiho's invitation. I'm sorry, what? Do, do we they based on your invitation to reflect on their own experiences and see where they might connect. I... Yes, so that was Paul Shoshin. Did you have a question? Um, I didn't think I raised my hand, but I, I do have a question. <clears throat> oh, ask me, where are you calling in from? Uh, Alabama. Not where in Alabama? A uh, little town called Lynette, Alabama. Where's Lynette? Right on the Georgia line. Oh, okay. Got you. Not terribly far from uh, Daishin. From? From Daishin. Oh, yeah. So you're not too far from Atlanta. About 90 miles. Oh, that's close, man. Well, I was wondering how um, your experience with uh, addiction and alcoholism influenced your practice. Um, I would say that my, this was another point. This comes back to Dyson's question about acceptance. So what I learned in the, when I went into this alcohol and drug treatment center in New Hampshire, I initially didn't go there because I thought alcohol and drugs were a problem for me. And I thought they were my solution. So I went there to get away from my problem, which was all of you. If all of you would just simply do what I know you were supposed to do, then I would be okay. And you just got, you weren't getting with the program. Now, they told me this place was like a country club. Yeah, swimming pool and good food. And I, you know, it was an escape for me. But halfway through this process, I had a breakdown. Now, actually, what it was a breakthrough. And I understood it. I understood at that point that um, really my, my problem, the, the only big, biggest problem I had in my life was that first fix, that first pill, the first drink. And that um, if I didn't, just didn't do that, that my life could be different. Acceptance. You know, I, I just simply accept that I cannot use mood altering and mind altering substances in safety. Now, that position has evolved over time. I understand because of the interconnected reality that I live in, that if I pick up one drink, I am supporting the industry that produces this stuff that leads to all the suffering that's caused as a result of people who don't have, who, who who don't have the capacity to not drink to, to intoxication. Um, we just, I mean, down it's happening down here all the time. Um, I don't know, you ever been down this neighborhood? Yes, I have. Yes, well, right up the road, Destin. It's a big tourist place. And, and so you have people coming in from Alabama, from Georgia, from Texas, from Arkansas. You have some people coming from further up north. Um, but they come down here to party, you know. Some guy gets some guy's driving drunk, um, loses control of his truck, um, flies across a medium into the parking lot of a hotel, kills three people, and 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 that could easily be me. So the acceptance then that I don't want to, I just really I I, I want to live differently in the world, and that clouds my judgment, clouds my mind. It doesn't allow me to really wake up. So um, not drinking, not using other drugs is, an, is a real uh, critical element of my practice. In fact, uh, it fits right in with, I don't know, maybe the third precept in the first 10 precepts we take. It says, don't take intoxicants. So um, yes, I embrace it. My life is all the better for it too. 
I tell you, I haven't been in jail in probably 30 years. What a nice thing. Question. Thanks for the question though, Shoshin, thank you. Interestingly enough, Shoshin, I, I, I have a person who studied with me for about 14, 15 years. He lives in the south of Germany, in uh, south of Munich. He near, lives near the Austrian border. He was a, um, a soldier in the East German army and his ordained name is Shoshin. Question. Going, oh, Daiho. Yeah. Um, the, you, uh, you do um, a lot of writing, and I, it's, I well, at least it appears that way, uh, and, and speaking, public speaking. I'm wondering, um, I, I found that, that uh, telling my war, war stories um, uh, as part of a, a, a talk on Zen uh, over the years, um, 50 years now, <laughs> Uh, has been very um, therapeutic uh, for me. Uh, and I'm wondering whether in, in writing uh, and speaking, you have found something similar. Uh, how has writing your experiences and talking your experiences um, affected your, your life, your heart, your shin? <laughs> that's good i like it um, writing has been the most powerful because things will come out of my pen or my pencil or they'll come off my fingertips on the keyboard that before i wouldn't i, I wouldn't have taught i wouldn't it wouldn't have come out of my mouth i've written things i've i've um, had um, truth revealed to me through writing that were that as long as i was talking um they were um invisible to me uh, I would say that speaking publicly um, or, or engaging in things like this are, are uh, a, a real, I can't, they, they're such a, it's such an important part of my practice because the questions that you ask me are teachings. They're teachings for me. So they drive me to reflect on the, the, the basics, I was going to say the fundamentals, but that word doesn't fit good in my mouth. The basics of, of Zen practice, they, they, it, it, um, it brings me deeper into the basics of Zen practice because it's in the basics um, and the very simplest of, of, the very simplest of, of gestures, the very simplest of actions where um, the the truth has a chance to show itself. Um, yeah, there's a number of writings that are on the website. In fact, um, Oakwood Publishing, who published the um, the second book, um, they're about to, um, they're about to publish a book of of veterans' writings. So, in in retreats with veterans, one of the practices that I give them is writing practice. So I, I give them a topic to write about. They don't they're not obligated to write about that, um, but they write about whatever is important for them to write about. And then um, we meet together as a group and they share those. You've been in these retreats, you know this process. And, and, they, and, and we re read those. I've collected a number of these um, stories over the years. They're, be, they're being um, organized and put into book form. And they'll also be highlighted with, with art, veterans art. Um, like, uh, and I'm just about to ask you, Daiho, because of some of the art that you shared with me. If, if some of that art could show up in that book. Um, so, so it's, uh, um, writing is, is, has been one of, the, has been much more powerful, but um, putting myself, I, so, so I see some Roxus out there. So I know some people are, are, are engaged in this linear or engaged in Zen practice. Uh, one of the, see, one of the maturation practices, at least in the lineage I'm ordained in, was a practice they called Dharma combat. And um, I don't like the term. Mm -hmm. So I, 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 I simply would rather refer to it as questions and responses. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the truth is that every time, every time I speak publicly, um, I, 
I always open it up for questions because this for me is that is the is these questions challenge me to mm -hmm. really so to really go deeper into the essentials of practice that have been passed on to me and and to be clear that I don't have any answers but that my responses need to be from a place of how I was educated and um, trained in Zen in, in, in the Zen lineage I'm ordained and from my life experience, just to be as candid and direct as I possibly can. So, so well, thank you very much, Anton. Does, does, yeah. does anyone else have a, a question um, to ask? We, we're running any short last, of time now. Uh, any last question? I have a silly one, if you'll pardon my uh, pardon me asking. Uh, what kind of motorcycle do you ride? Oh, oh um, I muted myself. Uh, right now, I'm, I'm, I'm not permitted to own. So I have, I have a loaner. That, uh, um, a guy lets me ride from time to time. And it's a 2015 um, Ultra Classic Limited Low. The Harley Davidson. But I, I've, been, <laughs> I've been a Harley rider. I've been a Harley rider forever. Um, yeah, so, um, and, and a number of people who, I don't know how it is, a number of people that, that come and practice with me also ride those kinds of motorcycles. Anshin? Yes. I would just like to say something. I, I know many of the people who are in this audience this evening, and I know that even though not everyone has spoken up and asked questions, that your talk tonight has raised a lot of questions in everyone's mind Good. about their own practice. Uh -huh. And everyone, I'm sure, has been able to relate their own life experiences to things that you've said and that your talk tonight will open up in our uh, Dokusan and our own meetings, that uh, group sessions that we will continue to have in the next couple of weeks um, will open up many doors for us. And I just wanted to thank you for that. Oh, you're welcome, Catherine. Thank you. Sure. I will say that one of the things that's been very important to me in terms of, of um, Zen practice is when speaking publicly um, to, um, I, I don't flaunt terms. So how to take, how to take terms that are maybe, maybe natural to us in the meditation hall and 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 introduce them in regular language um, so it's it's how to to bring the essence of how like right now the period of time we've been together and um, what i've been presenting is rooted in the diamond sutra and the langavatara sutra yeah. but i don't use the language of those two sutras but rather the language that is available to us all right. so yeah um right. Where, where, where did, oh, Denise, I wanted that screensaver you have when you're not, yeah? I was looking at that screensaver and I'm saying, that looks like my mind when I get too busy. <laughs> it's actually Crater Lake and it's a, not a very good picture, but I, there's a little Bodhisattva, felted Bodhisattva Buddha that I sat there and took a picture of him when I was right. there. So, so let me... I, I know we want to end, but I, what I'd like to do is just go person to person. I, I want to say thank you and goodbye. And I'd just like to know where you're calling in from. So I would like to say, Jill, um, it's a pleasure to meet you. Uh, thank you. And I'll say goodbye. Am I yeah. <clears throat> Hi, Anshin. I am Jill Kyoji, and this is my husband, Mark. And we're from uh, the mountains of Pennsylvania near Bloomsburg. Oh, Bloomsburg. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. So when I say slippery rock, you know. We know. <laughs> uh, right. Yeah, we have a daughter out near Pit in Pittsburgh. I am. Uh, um, Greg, I'll, I'll say goodbye to you. I know where you're calling in from. Thank you so much. Y you're welcome, Jill. Um, Jenna, um, I'll say goodbye to you. Where are you calling in from? I'm calling in from San Diego. Ah. Um, Derek Shindo. I'll say goodbye to you. And where are you calling in from? Thanks, Anshin. Uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico. Albuquerque, yeah. 
Um, Jenna, I know where you're calling in from. I'll say goodbye to you. Shoshin, I know where you're calling in from. I'll say goodbye to you. Thank you. Denise, I know where, you, did I ask you where you're calling in from? I didn't. No, um, I'm calling from Eugene, Oregon. And I just want to say, I we met once. Oh. I'm sure I, I, clearly you would never remember because it was at Choboji in Seattle, probably. Oh, Choboji, sure. I don't remember yeah. what you were, you were there, but you came for, I don't remember if it was a day sitting. But anyway, I, I really appreciate your talk tonight. And thank you. It's good to see you again. Yes. Um, Joel Hoffman, I'll say goodbye to you. And where are you calling in from? Oh, thank you so much for your talk tonight. I, I'm uh, calling in from Las Cruces, New Mexico. I'm, oh, yeah. uh, I'm in the same town with uh, Daiho and Chuke. Wonderful. How lucky you are. Indeed, um, yes. Zane, I'll say goodbye to you. And where are you calling in from? Thank you so much. And I am calling in from Lancaster, Pennsylvania. From where? Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Oh, Lancaster. Yeah, I had, yeah. I had uh, uh, for a long time, I had a... a Strong connection with the family in Lidditz. Oh, yeah, right down the road. <laughs> I know it. Yeah, I know it well. And also, I was uh, invited as a, a guest lecturer for three months at Moravian College in Bethlehem. Oh, awesome. Yes. Um, so, Catherine, I, I, I'll say goodbye to you, and I know where you're calling in from. Um, Angeline, El Angeline Marie, I'll, I'll say goodbye to you, and where are you calling in from? Thank you. I'm calling from British Columbia, Canada. Oh yeah, where in British Columbia? Um, Penticton. Yes, where is that in relation to the then, only place I really know in Vancouver? <laughs> yeah, we're about four hours south. Oh, all right. Yeah. So, you're, so you're quite down close to the- Yeah, right Washington. on the border. Yeah. Okay. Washington, yeah. yeah. Um, Jen, I'll say goodbye to you. And where are you calling in from? Thank you so much, Anshin. Uh, I'm calling in from Southeast Queensland in Australia. Wow. How are things down under? Cold at the moment. <laughs> oh, yeah. And, and uh, are you in the area that's locked down? We here have just gone into a three day lockdown as a precaution, but yeah, yeah we're, yeah. we're not in a bad place where we are, thankfully. Yeah. yeah. Please be safe. Would you like to share your Dharma name? My Dharma name is also Anshin. <laughs> ah, nice to meet you, Anshin. <laughs> so, uh, Ron, I'll say goodbye to you. Where are you calling in from? I'm calling in from Santa Fe. Ah, from Santa Fe. Yes. Um, you, you ever visit uh, Joan? No, was, I moved here during the pandemic, so I ah, haven't okay. been out yet. <laughs> yeah, so um, Joan Halifax has a, a center up there. Um, if you get the chance to visit, when you pop in, please say hello for me. Uh, Daishan, I know where you're calling in from, in Shinrai. I'll say goodbye to you. And that looks like a picture. Oh, Shinrai, are you there? Hmm. No, oh, there he is. Yeah, I am. I'm not... Well, Las Cruces, New Mexico. And oh. thank you for the coming and speaking with us and the work you're very welcome so i'll say goodbye to you when i, I bow to you and um daiho yes i i bow to you in gratitude mm. and I, I look forward to the next time we connect and i'm gonna offer you a big internet hug buddy uh -huh. <laughs> uh, all right i thank you very much uh claude anshin uh I want to remind everybody, this is the book that we'll be studying, uh, the, uh, the uh, At Hell's Gate by Claude Anshin Thomas. Um, I, I don't know if it's available in paperback or not. It, this is the first, this is when it first came out. This. this oh, time. yeah. It, it, yes. And if any of you have trouble getting the book, um, I left the foundation's um, foundation website address there. Um, mm -hmm. You can write to info at zalto.org. That'll be listed in the website. And uh, we'll be glad to get your book. Okay, I do uh, want to say I, I, I miss uh, I've I miss seeing you on occasion. You know. Um, yes. You're you're quite an inspiring um, monk. Um, and, Thank you. Uh, yes. All, all all around, very inspiring. 
Thank you thank again. And everyone, thank you for attending this evening. Uh, if you wish to continue with this uh, in our, in our uh, study group, it's uh, next Wednesday at 6 p.m. Uh, Mountain Daylight Time. And I'll be happy to um, engage with you. Uh, take care of yourselves. Be well. And uh, thank you very much. Good night. Thank you. Thanks, Dahil, Catherine.